Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at the sixth Nightmare on Elm Street movie, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, released in 1991. And although we're not done covering Freddy Krueger just yet, in some ways this is the final nightmare. It's the last solo Freddy film to take place within the original continuity of the series. It also happens to be widely regarded as the bottom of the barrel for Mr. Krueger's escapades. Freddy's Dead completely drops Alice Johnson and pretty much that entire tangled storyline that began back in Dream Warriors. In its place, we get an absurd plot about a ghost town Springwood and Fred Krueger's fully grown offspring, along with a handful of cameos and a final 10 minutes that were filmed and released in 3D. On top of all that, this is the film in which Freddy Krueger completes his transformation into a full-blown Looney Tune. It's really a movie that needs to be seen to be believed, so let's take a look at this mess and get to the kills. The movie begins with a quote, so I guess we're bringing that back. Nietzsche, huh? Maybe this movie will actually be more highbrow than I- Oh, well, hey, you know what? If they're gonna use a Freddy quote, I'm glad they picked the best one. Alright, ready for craziness? Apparently in 10 years, the entire population of miners is wiped out of Springwood, Ohio. Except for one surviving teenager. We can't even begin to get into how absurd this premise is, so I'm sorry, you're just gonna have to think about that one on your own while we keep running with this insane idea. The surviving teen is apparently this dude, known as John Doe the entire movie, and he's in the middle of a turbulent flight with some unsympathetic fellow passengers. I'm afraid of heights. Don't be a pussy. Yo, you know what happens to rude people, lady? They get sucked out of airplanes. John screams that he was almost out of Springwood, but everybody knows that almost doesn't count. And he drops out of the plane to plummet all the way back down into his bed that he wakes up in. Ah, shit, of course that was just a dream, and everything's normal now, right? Well, not quite. As the theme to Wizard of Oz plays, no joke, he looks out the window to find his house falling to the ground, and a laugh that sounds like the Wiki Wiki Witch of the Wild Wild West portends our first Freddy appearance of the film. I'll get you, my pretty! And your little soul, too! <laughs> Yeah. The house lands on Elm Street, of course, and John tries to make his way out of Springwood again by going to a bus ticket booth where Bob Shea laughs at how much money he's made with this franchise. The bus drives up and smacks into him, and can you believe the bus is driven by Freddy? No screaming while the bus is in motion! Wait, didn't we already do bus driving Freddy back in part two? Freddy drives him to the Springwood border and deports him through reality, or something, in an effect that I actually think is kind of cool despite the cartoon cutout hole that John leaves behind. Looks like Fred can't leave Springwood, so he's hoping John Doe can go fetch him some more victims. Yeah, good luck convincing anyone to go to Ohio, dude. Ha ha ha, go blue! Maybe he'll have some luck at this super sketchy looking youth shelter. Wait, didn't we pretty much do that in Dream Warriors? What the fuck? Might as well meet the staff and patients here, I guess. Our leading lady for these 90 minutes of garbage is Dr. Maggie Burroughs, played by Billy Zane's sister, Lisa, and she's currently dealing with patient Spencer, a young Brecken Meyer who loves video games and hates his dad. So you can look forward to both those characteristics being involved in his kill. Maggie's boss is Yafik Koto with a jerry curl, whose character is only known as Doc. And I'm actually shocked that Freddy doesn't ask him what's up at all in this entire movie. He's real into dream shit, which is why he has a poster in his office of, quote, ancient dream demons who would search people's dreams for the most evil person they could find. Then they give him the power to cross the line and turn our nightmares into reality. I don't like where this is going. Other patients include Tracy, a tough kickboxing lady who don't take no shit, and Carlos, a deaf dude with a hearing aid that he sometimes removes to tune out from everyone else. They and Spencer are plotting to get the shelter van driver to smuggle them away to California so they can blow this pop stand. Some cops find John Doe on the street and take him to the shelter, where Maggie questions him about his background. Where are you from? I DON'T KNOW! Besides having a hard time controlling the volume of his voice, and apparently having anger issues with pieces of furniture, he also knows he doesn't want to fall asleep because he might never wake up. Maggie finds a newspaper clipping in his pants featuring a picture that really jumps off the page. I won't tell. Cue a dream slash flashback where a little girl runs around a backyard with her unseen father. But the most revealing thing we get is a woman screaming before Maggie wakes up and it ends. John ends up falling asleep too, and wakes up in a dream where that same little girl leads him through the Elm Street house while his real life body sleepwalks up a keyed out staircase. Wonder if he'll find any clunky metaphors in the stream. Free me, you idiot! I'm your fucking memory! Oh yeah, looks like he did. He tells Maggie about his dream, and after she realizes it featured the same little girl that hers did, Yafit Koto tells her to help John Doe remember where he came from. And so we get a road trip in this nasty looking van that the mystery team might drive if Scooby and the gang suddenly came down with a mean addiction to crystal meth. They drive to Springwood, a nice place to live. But after John hallucinates the little dream girl in the road and spins the van out of control to avoid her, they find that the other troubled teens have been stowed away in the back of the van, I guess hiding behind those paper-thin sheets. 
sheets. They carry on to Springwood, where there's a fair going on straight out of a Steinbeck novel. There's only adults there, and they're all cursing at the kids, telling them to go on and get. Maybe because they're worried they'll take their spot in line for the bumper cars. The phones there don't work, but the cameo sure do, because Roseanne fucking Barr walks up to the kids and starts rubbing cheeks with them and asking if they'll come home with her. And hey, have another cameo, with Roseanne's then-husband Tom Arnold chewing the scenery like it's a can of skull. You know they bring him! Maggie sends the trio of teens off in the van to return to the shelter, while she heads off with John Doe to explore the town. Too bad they shot this on the same part of the Universal lot that would eventually become Wisteria Lane in Desperate Housewives, because holy shit, Springwood looks fake as hell in this movie. Even when they're driving down real streets, for some reason, it just doesn't feel real. They wind up getting stuck in a dream loop where they keep driving around the same town square and through the same intersection a whole bunch of times and shit, man, we just did that trick in Nightmare 4. I guess it's not plagiarism if you're stealing from yourself. When they try to find themselves out of this jam with a map, it quickly turns into a fire hazard that's also pretty profane. I asked you for the map. Yeah, well, the map says we're fucked. Maggie and John's adventure takes them past some derivative chalk art and into Springwood High, where a teacher instructs an empty class in a way too over-the-top manner. 1493! Freddy sailed across the sea. He emphasizes that in 1966, they took away Freddy's child and- Wait a minute, hold on. What's that about Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Freddy had a kid. Yeah, yeah, but like that chalkboard clearly says the atomic bomb drops fail. Is that- what, uh... What the fuck? The trio of trouble finally get tired of driving around in circles, and Tracy says that she's going to get some rest. In an abandoned house? Yeah? That's your plan? Just kick down the door to a dirty stranger's house? Oh, and look, you really seem to injure it there with that kick. Wait a minute. Hold up, is that? Yo, that's not just a random house, that's the Elm Street house again! It's everybody's favorite character! Hell yeah! And the audience goes wild! Carlos goes off on his own to get some sleep on the mattress version of that pig pen kid from Charlie Brown. Hope your scratching fingers are prepped and ready, dude, cause you about to be covered in bed bugs. When he wakes up, he's in dreamland and finds himself trapped against a brick wall with his angry mama abusing him for being a bad son. She takes out a very threatening cotton swab and then turns into Freddy Krueger, who sticks the swab into Carlos's ear and through his head in one of the grossest moments of the series. Also, shouldn't that just kill him? He's got like a thing going through his brain. He should definitely be dead. But no, we're gonna drag this one out. First, Freddy cuts off Carlos's ear, which deafens him and gives the audience some point of view hearing, which in this case means a heartbeat and heavy breathing as Freddy tosses Carlos into a boiler room setting where he can be a lot more comfortable. Once they're in there, Freddy's a world-class douche to Carlos by dancing around behind him and making a lot of noise he can't hear. He even breaks the fourth wall to tell the audience to shh. He eventually appears to relent and gives Carlos a hearing aid, but that thing starts deforming and bugging out and leaves Carlos with super hearing so powerful that a leaky faucet sounds like a beating drum to him. Like any good improviser, Freddy explores and heightens the game. First, he drops a single pin that sounds like a falling bomb on its way down, but Carlos is able to catch it and save himself the hearing damage. Then Freddy drops a whole handful of pins that sound like a hurricane of hammers against the metal grated floor. Finally, he takes a chalkboard and with some expert mime acting, starts scratching the board. First with a single finger knife and then with his whole hand, like he's scratching the belly of a Big old good dog. This ultimately causes Carlos's head to explode, sending the hearing aid back into Freddy's hand as he delivers a one-liner with kind of a Yoda voice going on. Nice hearing from you, Carlos. Now here's some shit that breaks the Elm Street rules. Carlos's body is just missing when Tracy goes to check on him. Then the screenwriters make the real narc mistake of treating weed like a hardcore hallucinogen, since Spencer's lying on the couch watching a broken TV and thinking it's actually on. Carlos appears on screen and tells him not to fall asleep, but it's too late. That kid faded. I don't know which storyline I hate more, but we switch it up back to Maggie and John as they go to the Springwood Orphanage. They find another loony adult talking to invisible children, as well as a picture signed by Kay Kruger, who John Doe is convinced must be him. He figures he's gotta be Freddy's kid since he's the only one left alive. As Maggie tries to tell him that's a stupid idea, Tracy pulls up in the van to take them back with her to that dirty house they're squatting in. Spencer wakes up to a Johnny Depp cameo where he parodies the famous Brain on Drugs commercial. But then Freddy's like, gonna hit you in the head with a frying pan, and tells Spencer that it's time to trip out, man. So Inagata DeVita starts playing while a Sunday school special version of some psychedelic scenery emerges from the TV screen to wrap around Spencer and pull him into the tube. Dude, he just smoked a joint. He didn't drop Sid. But accurate psychoactive effects or not, he's gone when the others get back to the house. And then we get what might be the lowest moment of the entire Nightmare series. Spencer finds himself in the middle of a Nick Arcade looking video game while Freddy controls him with a joystick. The game includes an 8-bit version of Spencer's dad, but those game designers could learn a lot about the art of subtlety. Be like me. Be like me. In fact, this scene has a whole bunch of god-awful lines, so let's just get them all out right now. Now I'm playing with power! Super Spencer! Free graphics. Nah, Freddy, nothing about this is great, especially Super Spencer. Super Spencer sucks. Then Spencer's body gets launched through a wall into the real world, and we have to watch shit like this, and this, and hear these sound effects. <laughs> 
John gets the idea to save Spencer in his dream, so he has Tracy knock him out with a pipe, and he disappears into a table, which, like, that doesn't make sense. Then Tracy joins him, saying she was able to get there just by concentration meditation, because we might as well just throw all the rules out the window at this point. Tracy and John sneak up on Freddy like they're a couple of kid detectives, and she kicks the controller out of Fred's hand. But he's got a little backup for just this occasion. You forgot the power glove! He uses the power glove to bop Spencer in the head and drop him down the stairs towards a- Oh shit, the rectum tunnel's back! Yep, and after Spencer falls down it, it farts out his soul or something, which goes straight back into Freddy. Oh. Yeah! Oh no. Tracy gives Freddy a kick in the nuts before Maggie wakes her up out of the dream, saving her from Freddy's finger knife swipe. But since John is still asleep, they have to carry him out into the van when they make their escape. But during his dream state, he wakes up to find himself in a burning bedroom, and when he launches himself out the window, he's back to falling down to earth like he was in the beginning. He pulls a cord that turns his shirt into a parachute, parachute, and also yanks his real life body through the roof of the van. John looks up to find Freddy spinning around the top of the parachute before he comes down to confront John face to face with some harsh truths. He says John isn't, in fact, his son, and that he allowed John to live only long enough for you to bring me back my daughter. With John useless to him now, he yells GROUNDED and cuts the strap to the harness, leaving John to fall towards the ground and a bed of nails that Freddy pushes into the road like he's goddamn Wile E. Kruger. We see the wounds appear in John's real life body, which makes sense, but then his corpse disappears from reality, which does not. And after his soul fart goes into Freddy's body, Kruger disappears too, with a joke that I honestly just don't understand. It's traveling time! Is that a play on words or something? Is traveling time a thing? Or is Freddy just spitting out word poop at this point? He travel times right right into Maggie's dome, and after some weird face stuff, she gets in the van so she and Tracy can drive out of Springwood, shattering that plate glass of reality while they do it. What is up with that thing? Back at the shelter, Maggie's fellow social worker doesn't remember anyone by the name of Spencer, or Carlos, or the new arrival John Doe. So what, Freddy's erasing his victims from other people's memories? Come on. But yeah, Fikoto is immune, apparently, and says he can remember them. Why? because I can control my dreams. Sure. Maggie finds some papers saying she was adopted, and that night, in another dream of hers, we get more of the Kruger backstory shaded in as we learn that Maggie, not John Doe, is Freddy's child all grown up. And the woman screaming in her earlier dream was her mom Loretta coming out of the cellar and telling Freddy that she won't tell anyone about whatever she found down there. As little baby Maggie learns, it's a back room with a whole bunch of finger knife gloves of various designs and Springwood Slasher newspaper clippings, as well as some shit suggesting Freddy killed the kids in his own house. What about part two's bitch and boiler room? As dumb as that is, it's it's not as dumb as the fact that nobody took that lock of hair out of this girl's eye before they shot this. Or even worse, how Maggie suddenly shows up dressed in the little girl's outfit, complete with pigtails. I get what they're going for here, but honestly, it just looks like she's about to go give a strip tease to some rich businessman with some real specific kinks. Freddy shows up and calls her Catherine, and confirms that when the authorities took her away from him, he got revenge by killing their kids? But wait, wasn't him killing kids the reason they took her away from him? This logic's running in circles, man! Freddy scares Maggie by saying he's going after the shelter now. She says he can't because this isn't Springwood, but like, like, has that been a rule this whole time? Or is it just another thing they're coming up with out of nowhere for this movie? Regardless, his loophole is to sprout an Elm Street sign in front of the building. God, this is so fucking dumb. First, Freddy goes after Tracy in her dream by appearing as her father, who, it's heavily implied, sexually abused her, so that sucks. She takes her revenge on her dream dad with a tea kettle, just beating the shit out of him with it. But then he sits back up with a messed up face and turns into Freddy. Freddy takes a few hits from Tracy and lazily says a one-liner. this? Bitch. Aw, come on, Fred. I feel like your heart's not even in it anymore. She escapes his whirring finger knife blades by burning herself on a stove and waking up out of the dream. With his Tracy attack foiled, Kruger moves on to Yafik Kodo, but after appearing in his dream, Doc just beats that bitch with a bat. Fred's not perturbed, though, since he just reenacts an OG nightmare scene while counting off the ways people have tried to kill him. He says that he's never been killed permanently because they promised him that he'd be eternal. They, the dream people. The ones that gave me this job. Yafit snags a piece of that sweater before an alarm system wakes him up, right as Maggie and Tracy rush into his room. I think I've got a way to get him. So what's the plan, Doc? Wait, what the fuck was that fade? Who the fuck is running this movie? Yafit says that if the sweater can come out of a dream, then so can Freddy, and that they can hurt him in the real world? Wait a fucking minute, Nancy did this shit five movies ago. Good lord, Freddy's dead. You have zero reason to exist. Yafit gives Maggie a pair of 3D glasses, because yes, the last 10 minutes of this movie were 3D, and she goes to sleep on the couch, waking up in a dream version of the same room and putting on the glasses to activate Freddy vision. Whoa, look at that hand. See, frying pan in infomercial, this is what your brain is like on drugs. She hops into 
the Doc's poster and walks past the Jim Henson dream demons into Freddy's stupid face looking stupid. So I guess we're inside his brain now as the Wizard of Oz music plays again and the dream demons take the form of lost souls from Doom, getting all up in the audience's face in 3D. Traveling through Freddy's memories, Maggie finds herself in a school classroom and watches as Kid Freddy takes a hammer and smashes the class hamster with it. A robot chicken cut takes Maggie to another time where she witnesses teenage Freddy getting in trouble with his stepdad, Alice Cooper. Cooper beats on Freddy with a belt, even though, like, how are you about to hit a dude who looks that much like Kenneth from 30 Rock? But Fred just stands there and takes it, and eventually sticks his razor out to kill his foster dad. This is all we see of it, which is real dumb, I know, but that's actually a confirmed kill, so I'm adding it to the count. Deal with it. Another robot chicken cut puts Maggie at the scene of Freddy's original mortal death, where we witness exactly what happened as he burned to death inside that building. We know what you want. I want it all! Of course you do. Then open up. And you shall be forever! Ooh, wow, okay, so that was the day he became Freddy Krueger. As my girlfriend Chelsea said during this scene, We weren't supposed to see this. One final robot chicken cut puts Maggie back in the Elm Street basement, where she watches her younger self run outside to find Dada strangling Mama to death. So yeah, Freddy murdered his wife with his bare hands in reaction to her finding a secret stash of dead kid stuff. Maggie's mad about Fred killing her mom, so she hits him with a pipe and grabs onto him, which Doc and Tracy see, so they pull her out of her dream. But Maggie wakes up on the couch by herself. They go to the little armory they have in the basement of stuff apparently confiscated from Spencer and other kids. Jesus, y'all had Negan in that youth shelter? Maggie finds a makeupless Freddy Krueger crying on the basement floor, whining about how he's not so bad a guy, honest. Maggie doesn't buy it and hits him with the bat, then knocks his glove off to fly at the audience. Whoa, look out, 3D, holy shit. But now Freddy's back into his old burnt face appearance, and he starts strangling Maggie to death, because like mother, like daughter? She fights back, hitting him with his glove and biting at his face a bit before breaking some of his fingers. Then Maggie pins Freddy to the wall with an assortment of weapons, including knives, shurikens, and a freaking crossbow. But she saves the best for last putting on Freddy's finger knife glove and stabbing him a few times in the gut with it. Wait, oh, sorry, she's not done yet. She saves the second best for last by sticking a pipe bomb in his torso. Then she tells him Happy Father's Day and gives him a smooch before running away to safety. Freddy's death is preceded by a joke, of course. Kids. And then he blows that up. And his head vomits another his head, which explodes into the little dream demon thing swimming around the air like nasty hell sperm. Dear Lord, this reveal is just as bad as Jason's soul being a nasty slug thing and goes to hell. Maggie's Freddy vision glasses reappear and Yafikoto takes them off. For. Hey Maggie, can you guess what movie I hope I never have to watch again? Freddy's dead. That is correct. Freddy's dead, and so is my enjoyment of these movies. Let's get this shit over with and head to the numbers. What happened to you, Freddy? You used to be cool. Six people died in Freddy's Dead, including two people in flashbacks and, of course, Freddy Krueger himself. All in all, the victims included five men and one woman, the most imbalanced gender ratio of the entire series. With a runtime of 89 minutes, that comes out to a kill on average every 14.83 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Carlos. If the chalkboard thing was the only silly Looney Tunes gag in this movie, I'd actually be okay with it. Plus, it's an exploding head. That's always fun. The machete for lamest kill will go to Spencer. I know there was an off-screen death, but even that's not as lame as all the stupid sound effects that were part of Spencer's drawn-out video game murder, which ultimately was just him falling down a hole. And that's it. Freddy's Dead The Final Nightmare came out in 1991 and is a giant pile of steaming shit. But we're not done yet. Next week we get meta with Wes Craven's new nightmare. And until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching my kill count for Freddy's Dead. I want to thank a couple of my patrons like Gabriel Baena and Ryan Aviar. A couple more weeks left of Freddy and then we get a new franchise. The big hint is that it's starting in March. Also, I just had a viewers poll for a kill count in March and it looks like Velco Experiment's gonna win. So you have that to look forward to during a Monday in March. Every Friday this year is gonna be a franchise. All right, y'all be good people.